Hello, microbe friends, and guten Tag from our studio in Hilden. Today, we will feed your curiosity and help you reveal microbe secrets. Welcome to Curious. My name is Julie. I'm the senior global product manager responsible for microbiome extraction products. Together with Dominic, our microbiome um, product development director, we will be your host. Thanks, Julie. Really happy to be here and talking about microbes and microbiome research. It's something that I've been very busy with over the last uh, many years now, actually. Um, it's been our primary focus. And today we're going to talk about lots of different topics, um, starting with challenging samples. We'll be talking about soil um, and all the different challenges associated with that, about water, wastewater, um, as well as human microbiome, and not just gut and fecal samples, but all the different kinds of human microbiome samples that there might be. Um, and we'll have some tips and tricks along the way as well. Mm -hmm. And around the middle of the show, we will have our experts joining uh, from DPCR and NGS. And uh, to close the show, uh, Professor Zegara will talk to us about human microbiome. Yes, and also throughout the show, we'll be talking about some of the new product developments that we have coming out in the near future, um, some new things that we'll be launching, as well as talking about uh, automation options for our existing kits. Right. But of course, this show has been designed for you. So you are invited to ask your burning questions at all times. This will connect you with our colleagues in the background, Maria and Malgochata. So if they can wave at us, that'd be great. And uh, to make sure that your questions are coming in, uh, you have to exit the full screen mode and make sure to enter your name as well so that we can get back to you um, in case there's no immediate response. Via that channel, we will also be asking you uh, questions um, for the poll. And uh, we actually have uh, the first one coming in because it'll be great to get to know you better. So, in what of the following areas does your microbiome research make an impact in? And while you're answering, we have prepared a little video with key statements from three of our scientists. What passionates me about uh, intestinal microbiome is the fact that it's composed by a complex ecosystem of these microorganisms that they are leaving the balance and according to the environment that they have in intestine, they change their abundance and composition. So that means that these bacteria are perfect sensors informing us about the disorders in our body. So that means that is an ideal reservoir to develop diagnostic tools and that opens a new paradigm to diagnose and to treat digestive disease through the modulation of this bacteria. I started being interested in this field more than 13 years ago now, uh, when uh, the first data sets uh, from uh, mental genomics were becoming available, and it was clear already at the time that we needed new computational methods to try to make sense of these large and abstracted set of uh, data. We are focused on developing non-invasive diagnostic tools and therapeutic products just for digestive disease and based on studying the intestinal microbiome. Uh, and so with this, our goal is to introduce uh, the use of intestinal microbiome in the clinical standards uh, to manage digestive disease. We all know that there are tons of microbes living in our gut and we can somehow manage a miracle balance between another with another uh, millions of thousands of microbes. They have a lot of nutrients, they have their needs they need, and they're their peace and love. As their host, we are sometimes attempted by some food products that are not cautiously prepared, which then bring in a lot of foodborne pathogens. 
So the pathogens, after they go into our body, they're like amazed. Jesus Christ, uh, there are a lot of nutrients. There's everything I want. I'm going to colonize here. I'm going to live here. But the resident bacteria, they're like, no, this is not how it works. I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to protect my habitat. So there are some kind of competitions between the commensal bacteria and the foodborne pathogens. And that's what we study currently. And we try to understand the behavior of the gut community. And we try to figure out if there are some kind of weapons we could utilize to kill the foodborne pathogens as a novel antimicrobial strategy. So at the time, I started developing new methods to try to make sense of the taxonomic and functional diversity of the microbiome, arriving to the discovering of many uh, new microbial species in the human microbiome, or even, for example, distinguishing specific nucleotide, specific mutation, uh, differentiating two strains of the same species into different samples. We developed these uh, new methods and we apply them on real uh, case uh, you know, uh, problems like uh, in the medical field or in the nutritional field, for example. So I envision that the use of intestinal microbiome will be introduced as a clinical um, a standard for the management of digestive disease, which is the field that we um, have more evidence. And I expect in five years to have successful um, cases uh, where uh, we have patients that has been diagnosed and treated through um, microbiome um, markers and treatments that modulate intestinal microbiome. And I guess that we will have more insights about the role of intestinal microbiomes in other diseases which are not in the field of digestive disease. May I say, like uh, neurological ones such as Parkinson and or uh, metabolic ones. So I think that in five years, uh, microbiome will be um, in our daily um, daily days in the clinical practice. And so maybe we will consider like uh, the analysis of intestinal microbiome as a regular check such as is the blood test uh, because we will consider it as a new whole organ that we have to check to manage uh, a differential diagnosed from the beginning. And I think we reached uh, as a field uh, a step that is very critical and I think uh, there are all the uh, possibilities that in five years from now and metadesomics will be applied routinely in many uh, real life examples. For I think in, I'm thinking, for example, at the medical field in which uh, you know patients, uh, oncological patients, may be profiled for their uh, gut microbiome to try to understand what is the best possible immunotherapy approach for that, or in nutrition, for example, to try to understand what is the specific personalized. A dietary regime which is best for each of us given our unique microbiome and our unique biology in general. I think these and many other applications are really really ready to be arriving to the field so I think it's a very exciting field uh, to study the human microbiome and other microbiomes as well and develop new methods uh, so, so that we can arrive uh, as soon as possible to have an impact in many uh, realize uh, uh, problems and uh, settings. So uh, in the next couple of years, I'm thinking, I'm hoping, or kind of I'm foreseeing there will be more uh, cutting edge techniques emerging to be combined with current microbiome studying techniques so that we can really uh, come up with a solid conclusion. And then we can draw a microbiome profile of any given ecosystem so that uh, we can use that as a feature to characterize a, a human being uh, health status or the uh, biological structure of an environment. So it sounds that human microbiome is a great te territory for discovery, right? Yes. And uh, it'd be great to see now what you think. So can we please have the poll results? Okay, so I think uh, 
Not surprisingly, we see that improving human health and well-being is, is uh, leading the poll results here. I think that's one of the most exciting areas for microbiome research. Um, and monitoring pathogens and outbreaks um, may fall into that as well. Um, but also quite a lot of people who are interested in biodiversity sustainability efforts. Um, and that goes into the environmental monitoring side of things. Um, yeah, so I think quite a, quite a diverse set of applications, and I think that's what has really characterized microbiome research, that we see that it affects almost every aspect of our life. Right, and hopefully we can cover all of those topics uh, within this show. And uh, since human was actually the most um, answered one, I'm actually happy to see this because Professor Segata will be joining us later in the show, so stay tuned. But before we get there, let's focus on the microorganisms that are beneath our feet. Indeed, we are digging into the captivating realm of soil microbiome. So Dominic, you've been working with your team for many years on soil microbes. Uh, would you please tell us why it's so challenging to start with soil samples? Uh, yeah, Julie. So, so soil is really difficult primarily because of the matrix that it's in. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, we are all familiar with soil, um, and uh, I can show really briefly a little bit here. Um, uh, coming up in a minute will be some other slides, um, but really what's challenging about soil is in the first line, the humic substances that are present. Mm -hmm. So this is what gives soil its characteristic brown colors. Um, it's the result of organic decomposition as microbes break down plant and animal matter um, and turn it into small organic compounds within mm -hmm. the soil. Um, the challenging part about that is all of these small chemicals that result that we call humic acids or fulvic acids or human. Um, some of them have very similar charges and sizes to nucleic acid. Um, and so they will bind with your nucleic acid as you try to extract it. And they'll also interfere with all of your downstream applications on your NGS or your PCR. Mm -hmm. So is that holding true for all sample types or would there be other there's there's a wide range of issues within different sample soil types. Mm -hmm. um, some soils have a much higher mineral content. Um, mm -hmm. Some have a lot more clay present in them. Some have low organic content, like sandy soils. Mm -hmm. um, marine sediments will have different issues than other ones. Um, so there's a lot of chemical issues coming from the different soil types as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, particularly for sandy soils, one of the issues is low yield. Um, so if you have if you have a low organic material, then of course you're not going to have a whole lot of microbes present, mm -hmm. and then it becomes really critical to isolate as many of those microbes as you can um, and attempt to extract um, every one of them that's present to be able to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, we optimize the yield of all of our kits, and we actually okay. find that our Power Soil Pro kit, which is optimized for your high yield from uh, high organic content soils, also works the best for us for low biomass and uh, low organic content soils mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. So a great tool for our soil microbe uh, researchers. So this is the first challenge and the metrics of the actual soil, but the microbes itself also come with other challenges, right? Yes, and those are mostly related to the cell wall of the microbes. Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. we have, um, generally people think about bacteria whenever mm -hmm. they think about microbes um, and microbiome research, bacteria is the first thing that pops into mind, but particularly in soil, you also have a lot of fungal activity and you may also have archaeal species present um, and they all have different challenges. So they all have very rigid cell walls. Um, here is some diagrams showing what their cell walls look like and we'll start off with the gram negative bacteria. Um, so all bacteria, have a cell wall formed of peptidoglycan, um, which is a very rigid, difficult to lyse material. Gram-negative cells have a relatively thin layer of peptidoglycan, um, but they also have an outer membrane. Um, beyond that, where, to which they might have other proteins associated, or they also have uh, lipopolysaccharides, um, so LPS on the outside, that can pose their own challenges for lysis, and they can give the bacterial cells different kinds of chemical resistances. Um, Gram-positive bacteria, um, are also characterized by that peptidoglycan, mm -hmm. um, but it's a much thicker layer. They don't have an outer uh, membrane, um, but they have a, up to tenfold or more thicker uh, layer of peptidoglycan on the outside, makes them much more rigid. That's also what makes them stain under gram stain. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, why they're called gram positive bacteria. Um, and so they, all these bacteria need these things to keep the cell walls rigid um, so that they don't break under mm -hmm. osmotic pressure or under inf uh, environmental influences. And the same thing's true for fungus, but they go about it in a very different way. So instead of peptidoglycan, 
Fungal cell walls are a mixture of beta-glucans and chitin um, with also some mannoproteins and other glycoproteins on the outside. Serves the same purpose, um, but fungal cells generally are also quite a lot larger than bacterial cells, mm -hmm. which means that they also have some different challenges associated with beating them. Um, and then the last type of microbe um, or prokaryote here is also archaea. Um, and Archaea may have a pseudopeptidoglycan. It's not exactly the same as in bacteria, um, but it serves the same purpose of giving it a strong outer cell wall. And a lot of these also have um, uh, outside protein membranes, which give them resistances to being broken. So because the chemical content of all of these different types of cells is so different, we find that um, mechanical lysis is ideal. Mm -hmm. um, so if we use mechanical lysis, we can break open all of your different kinds of cells. And whether you're looking at gram-negative, gram-positive, fungal, or archaeal species, um, you're able to, to crack them open. Um, and then we use a lysis chemistry, get all the biomolecules into solution, negate all of your secondary chemical effects wherever you can. Um, and then you should, be, you should be good to go. Great. So you mentioned it already earlier. So the way we address those challenges is actually with the DNAZ Parasol Pro. And I went to the lab a few days ago uh, to show you how we extract DNA from soy samples. Today, we will look at one of the most abundant and diverse ecosystems on Earth, soy. Soy samples collected from the same source have variable microbial load and different organic makeup. After collection, use your sample as soon as possible, as prolonged storage will affect the microbial composition. For later use, store it in PowerProtect DNA RNA or put it in the freezer. For small sample with large microbiome load, use the DNAZ PowerSoil Pro Kit. For low biomass samples, use the DNAZ PowerMax Soil Kit that features tubes that can handle larger volume. Are you ready for the extraction? Let's start with the lysis. Briefly spin the PowerBeat Pro tubes to make sure that the beads have settled down. Use a weighing paper or funnel to transfer the soil and put it into the tube. Make sure to not overfill to prevent inefficient disruption. You can also store the tubes overnight in the freezer. Before disruption, make sure to thaw to room temperature to avoid tube breakage. Adding solution CD1 to your PowerBeat Pro tubes would help disperse the soil dissolve the humic acids and protect the DNA from degradation. Briefly vortex your sample before I show you our new instrument. This is our new tissue laser 3. Disrupt the sample using 25 Hertz at five minutes or use one of our pre-installed protocol called soil DNA. After the disruption, centrifuge your tube to pellet the solids. Transfer the supernatant in two ml micro centrifuge tubes your sample is now lysed and homogenized. And that's it. Your DNA is ready for downstream application. All right, Julie, looks like you had fun in the lab. Yeah, indeed. But it was mostly interesting to be able to put myself into the shoes of a microbiome researcher. So you've seen uh, during the video our tissue laser 3, but it surely deserves more screen time. So let's follow Dominic with a K so that he can show us the new features of the instrument. Today we will homogenize soil samples with the tissue laser 3. They can be used later for DNA extraction with the DNEC Power Soil Pro Kit. Let's look at the touchscreen interface of the instrument. From the home screen, you can start the sample disruption run directly. Press the buttons for time and frequency and adjust to the setting required for your sample using the rotary knob. The Tisha Lesser 3 can save up to 12 disruption programs. Seven of them are pre-installed and five are customizable. For our trial run today, let's select Soil DNA from the list of programs. 
Now that we have selected our program, let's prepare our sample. I've weighed 250 milligrams of soil, which I am pouring into a power bead pro tube from the DNEC Power Soil Pro Kit. Now I am adding lysis buffer to the tube. You can choose from different adapters depending on your needs. Now it's time to place our sample in the adapter. Distribute the tubes evenly to ensure safe operation. Assemble the adapter. Your sample is now ready to be lysed. After the initial run, rotate the plates to allow even disruption of the samples and restart the program. Take out your tube from the adapter. And it's that simple. You are now well on your way to a successful lysis, thoroughly homogenized samples and nucleic acid isolation. So that was our tissue laser 3. But we have more to come and actually a premiere today. Dominic? Yes, we do. We have a new kit for extraction of RNA from soil, the RNEZ Power Max Soil Pro Kit. Um, so this is a new development that we'll be launching uh, in September now. Um, and it is designed to get high amounts of RNA out of soil, which has previously been quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Because there's really little RNA uh, amount in soil samples. Because generally the RNA amount in soil is low, mm -hmm. um, and it's also the challenges that I talked about earlier with soil are particularly bad for mm -hmm. RNA, um, mm -hmm. all the extra interactions. And so the way around it is to scale up your extraction. So we have a new bead tube that we use for the extraction. These are with the Power Bead Pro tubes using all of our other microbial extraction kits, um, also compatible with the Tissue Lyser 3, of course. Um, and by scaling up, it lets us process anywhere from 500 milligrams to uh, 15 grams mm -hmm. of soil, um, making sure that you have enough RNA for your downstream applications. If it's sequencing, metatranscriptomics, um, or PCR, anything that you might need to do. Okay, so this is then great news for our researchers that are doing metatranscriptomics from, from Yes, Poison. absolutely. So we actually, we've sent this out to some field testers already, um, and some of them have come back with the, the feedback that they love it, because mm -hmm. uh, extractions where they used to have to do three to five replicates and then pool all of those eluates, um, they can now do it in a single extraction. Great. So this is coming then in September. And uh, we also have more to come. And actually, uh, this is going to be like the sample to insight in a kit format, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, we have um, what we're calling the microbiome WGS seek sets. Um, I have a couple of slides to show how those work. Um, so this is a combination of all of our best-in-class microbiome extraction and sequencing kits, as well as the downstream um, analysis, mm -hmm. so through CLC genomics. Um, so for the extraction part, um, we can either start with the Kaya Amp Power Fecal Pro Kit, if you're looking at stool samples, um, and then that goes into the library prep, which combines our KayaSeq FX DNA library prep, um, as well as the normalizer to make a rapid normalization of your libraries possible for multiplexing, um, and the KayaSeq beads for a cleanup. Once you have your FASTQ files, you can upload them to GeneGlobe, um, and within the microbial analysis portal, you get your comprehensive metagenomic analysis immediately, giving mm -hmm. you the feedback. Um, and if you're looking for soil, you can also start with the DNEZ Power Soil Pro kit instead um, as a seek set. And again, you get all the components that are present here um, as a single catalog number, giving you sample to insight results, um, mm -hmm. the whole workflow. And just to give a quick example of what that might look like is here, um, so we have uh, this is where the result would come out after you have uploaded your FASTQ files into GeneGlobe, gone through the microbial analysis portal. It will provide you with taxonomic identification, your microbial species abundance profiling, um, your alpha and beta diversities, um, and we can also offer antimicrobial resistance gene identification within your samples. Um, and so here's just an, a quick example of what an OTU table might look like. This is the taxonomic abundance from different samples, giving you species identification across these different samples. Um, so it's really an, an all-inclusive workflow, um, particularly good for people just starting out in microbiome research. Right. So you've heard it, right? This set is really ideal for the researchers that want to start in, in microbiome fields. And if you're interested to try one of those kits, uh, you're welcome to drop us a note in the chat function and uh, somebody will get in touch with you and provide you with a quote. Speaking of chat function, I think that Maria and Malgocetta are joining us now. 
And they have some questions from the audience. Hello. Hi, hello. Yeah, we have quite a few questions. Um, and so to give some examples, uh, the often, quite often asked question is about samples that are collected previously and how to ensure the integrity of the microbial load of the sample. So for instance, fecal samples. And that samples are quite difficult because of the chemical composition can endanger our DNA stability. And we suggest using power protect DNA RNA, which is a solution which we can use to preserve our sample for a further <coughs> analysis in the laboratory. And it can be used for storing the sample in the fridge, freezer, but also in the room temperature. <laughs> Correct. And another question we got was in regards to the Denizi um, Power Soil Pro Kits, because it's the best kit for actually isolating um, low biomass samples from surface swabs. And it's better than the original uh, Power Soil technology because it isolates even more and um, pure microbial DNA from all soil types, including compost, clay, and topsoil. Now, the efficient uh, lysis that we have in this kit comb in combination with the inhibitor remover technology is also reflected in our sequencing results, something similar to what Dominic just showed. We could see a higher um, alpha diversity as measured by um, the OTUs um, in comparison to other extraction methods. So another quite interesting but a difficult to process sample is the biofilms. <clears throat> and biofilms basically consist of bacteria that are attached to the substrate by different polymeric substances. And as such are not very easy to break down or, and to process. So we offer a dedicated kit, which is the NEZ Power Biofilm for this type of samples. And it has again robust bead beating that <clears throat> and the lysis buffer that will break down the sample and also the inhibitor removal technique that will ensure that DNA that we will obtain will be quite good for any downstream application. Yes, and speaking of difficult sample types, water is a challenging sample as well, because usually the uh, analytes in question are pretty diluted. Um, now, the best way to process a water sample is actually using a DNEZ Power Water Kit or the DNEZ Power Water Sterovix Kit. Which kit actually fits your needs will depend on uh, the analyte you would like to look at and, of course, what type of membranes you have access to or you would like to use for your downstream uh, or upstream, in this case, collecting your, your water samples. Um, but Julie, Dominic, you will talk about this in your next session, right? That's water right. samples and how to, <laughs> to deal with them? Absolutely. So thank you very much, Maria and Malgocetta. Um, you will stay with us actually until the end of the show, so keep on asking your questions and uh, they will help us answering. So as we heard, uh, Maria said that um, it's very difficult to work with water samples mm -hmm. uh, because they usually come with very low uh, concentration in bacteria, viruses. So shall we move then to that part, Dominic? Yes. Yeah, let's talk about water. Um, so yes, water is a, a challenging sample primarily because it does have, um, it's dilute, right? It's, mm, yeah. As your um, bacteria are present, they're present in um, generally sparse concentrations, um, but they're of course very important for environmental monitoring. They're important for the health of oceans and lakes and rivers and streams, um, but they're also important for human health. So monitoring of uh, recreational beaches and so on is also important to know which bacteria are present there. Um, and which may also influence things like beaches being closed or not. Mm -hmm. um, but it is difficult because, as I said, they're dilute samples, um, and generally it's difficult to start off with three liters of water and right. get your DNA out of it, so we're going to have to concentrate. Um, and there's different ways to concentrate. Um, you can do adsorption. So this is when you have a surface that has an affinity for the, the substances that you'd like to isolate, either bacteria or viruses. Um, and they actually just stick onto that surface as you move them through. Um, you can do classical filtration as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is what uh, Maria was talking about when we were doing filtration with the Sterevex kits or other filters. Mm -hmm. um, this is classically used for bacteria, right? So you can, you can filter your bacterial cells out very easily, um, concentrating the water, all the bacteria stay behind on that filter. Um, and then a the last method of concentration 
is around centrifugation. So mm -hmm. specifically, if you have like very turbid water um, mm -hmm. or lots of sediment, you can spin those samples down, um, process the pellet, and then it's uh, all the bacteria are generally associated with that solid fraction. Um, right. That's another way that you can concentrate out of those large samples. And that's used, for example, often in wastewater mm -hmm. applications as well. But so is filtration. Um, and I believe for filtration, we also have some more information. Exactly. So our colleague Nathan went to the lab to show you what's the best way to uh, disrupt uh, the filter sample. Water filtration is a typical method used to concentrate samples during nucleic acid extraction using the Dionysi or Aranesi power water kits. And this step isn't trivial. Today, I'll show you best practices for handling water filters. After the water has been filtered, remove the top of the funnel. Then, using a sterile forceps, take the membrane, grabbing both sides, so that the membrane is facing inwards. Put the filter in the bead tube so that it fits properly. Now add the corresponding lysis buffer. And fasten the cap tightly. And now it's time for beat beating using a vortex or a tissue lyser. The optimized slices buffer and beads break the cell walls, releasing the nucleic acids. When this step is finished, take the supernatant and continue the Dionysi or Ironesi power water kit according to protocol. And suddenly, water isn't so hard to handle after all. So welcome back. And uh, now I think we want to go more in depth into the wastewater because yes. it's a um, yeah, very big said, sample type. It's, it's an important sample type, um, especially now after the COVID pandemic and during the COVID pandemic, um, wastewater monitoring became an essential tool for seeing where the pandemic was um, most active. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really established wastewater monitoring as a standard process. Um, so not just to, to look for COVID, um, but we're also looking for quite a few other substances that might be present within wastewater. Um, so this is of course going to have a lot more content also coming from municipalities. This, mm -hmm. is, this is classically coming from a sewer shed, coming in, being concentrated. Um, and so it gives you an insight into what's happening in the community that that sewer shed serves. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, COVID is one that has been used regularly. Um, Pre-COVID, polio monitoring was done through wastewater um, based epidemiology. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we have this great infrastructure for wastewater, um, people are looking at antimicrobial resistance genes. People are looking for new and emerging pathogens. Um, COVID monitoring is continuing, but we're also expanding that out to things like influenza, norovirus, um, RSV. I really think that wastewater-based epidemiology is, is here to stay and will continue to expand in the future. Yeah, because it has so many information that are there to be uncovered. Mm -hmm. Great. So depending on what uh, the researcher or the group would be doing, they would need to choose the right assay technology. And uh, to understand better what you are doing, uh, we have another poll. So the question will come up now uh, into the, the section. So which assay technologies are you using for analyzing microbes? And while you're answering, uh, we have a little video for you, uh, our care genius. And after that, we will uh, meet again with Eli and Afif, our experts in DPCR and NGS. Hi, I'm Kaya Genius. And in this episode, I will cover the what, why, and how of microbial detection. Let's have a look at the first question. Question one. What is the most critical factor to consider when extracting microbial nucleic acids for successful DPCR analysis? Besides efficient lysis of microbial cells and high nucleic acid yield, 
it is critical to remove PCR inhibitors. For example, bile salts, hemoglobin, and heme in stool, fulvic acids or humic acids in water and soil, fats, glycogen, polysaccharides, and minerals in food samples. These substances can interfere with PCR amplification by reducing the activity of DNA polymerases or interfering with the annealing of primers and probes. Question two, how will my microbial applications benefit from DPCR? Some of the apparent advantages of DPCR are precise and accurate microbial load assessment, fast results during public health or food safety surveillance and monitoring, rare target detection in low biomass samples, measurement of the absolute abundance of DNA of specific microbial taxa without a standard curve, and multiplexing of up to five targets, with the possibility of detecting viral RNA and microbial DNA together. I find this final question very interesting. Question three, why should I rely on a Kyogen workflow for microbial detection? Are there specific DPCR assays? Your laboratory can benefit from Kyogen's standardized, sensitive, and fast microbial detection workflow. Patent Pending Inhibitor Removal Technology, IRT, included in Denisi, Arnisi, AllPrep, and Kaya Amp Power and Power Pro Kits Manual or Automated, successfully remove inhibitors during nucleic acid purification. More than 685 assays for microbial detection, including 387 bacterial assays, 35 fungal assays, 46 viral targets, and 202 virulence factors and antibiotic resistance genes have been developed by scientists. And they have wet lab validated the multiplexing of several assays relevant to the human microbiome or cannabis production. I encourage you to explore workflow capabilities by downloading this free poster. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for my next episode. Okay, welcome back. Um, and I'm joined here by uh, Ellie from our NGS team and Afif from our digital PCR team um, to talk about the detection technologies that we use for microbiome research. Um, but before we get into that, um, let's take a look at the poll results. Okay, so we had asked which assay technologies are being used for analyzing microbes, um, and it looks like the majority of people are using sequencing, either whole genome sequencing or targeted DNA sequencing. Um, and uh, even more people are using digital PCR than classical mm -hmm. PCR. Um, um, so that looks uh, quite interesting, a mix of analysis techniques being used here. So um, maybe we'll start with you, Afif. Yeah. Why, is, why is digital PCR so well suited to microbial uh, analysis? Thank you, Dominic. Um, allow me first just to um, remind our viewers that uh, they can uh, scan a a scan, sorry, a QR code that will appear on the screen now um, and um, to invite them for our digital PCR festival, which will be in uh, less than one month now on the 28th of September. We are celebrating two things, the, three, the third anniversary of the Kaya Acuity, the digital PCR solution from Kyogen, and the 40th anniversary of uh, PCR. Um, we will have around 18 presentations from KOL from around the world, um, and I hope that um, many will be able to, uh, to register. Now, I will be back to your question. Um, of course, um, you know, uh, digital PCR um, allows absolute quantification of a target nucleic acid by partitioning um, the sample into uh, thousands of individual reaction wells. Now, this partitioning will uh, reduce um, the competition between um, target and non-target molecules, will uh, increase the sensitivity, and will reduce also the effects of inhibitors. So the result will be a more precise and accurate quantification of low abundancy targets often found in wastewater. Mm -hmm. So now, this is why it's used for COVID monitoring yes, so regularly, yes, right? Yes, yes. And so believe me or not, this is just the first feature. 
So the second feature is specific for the nanoplate-based DPCR mm -hmm. because it's amenable to standardization across different laboratories, allowing for a better comparability of results between different studies, different experiments, and in different locations. Mm -hmm. And now last uh, but not least, um, the high accuracy and precision of digital PCR is a key role or plays a key role um, in the detection uh, or the early detection and monitoring um, of uh, disease outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So public health, um, pub public health lab laboratories um, will use the technology to take quick actions uh, and contain the spread of infections. Because they know exactly what they're looking yeah, for yeah. and can get and, that really sensitive yeah. detection yeah. from it. Yeah. And um, those are only three features. We prepared more than 10, so, but of course we don't have the time to, yes. but we will be able to share them with our viewers also, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so for, and then in contrast, um, uh, NGS, so Next Generation Sequencing Technologies, you can do shotgun or you can do targeted, those both came up. Um, what would be the pros and cons of those two technologies? Yeah, so it really depends on what you're trying to investigate. So for whole genome sequencing, it's really comprehensive. You're looking mm -hmm. at the entire genomes of a microbial community. And so because of this, this is really well suited when you're looking at novel microbes or novel antimicrobial resistant genes. Um, this is the kind of technique that's used. And for this, we have our Chi-Seq FX DNA library kit. Mm -hmm. This is, has many features, but one I want to highlight is that it has low GC bias. So when you're working with wastewater samples, um, you have various types of microbial species that are mm -hmm. in there and have various GC content. So you want to make sure that the library uh, preparation kit that you're using is robust enough to deal with these different variations. And not, not just wastewater either, all sorts of samples. Anything exactly. microbial yeah, has yeah, a broad definitely. GC range. Yeah. You want to capture everything that's mm -hmm. in your sample, so to have accurate results. Um, when you're moving into the targeted sequencing, of course, it's looking for the targets or the specific pathogens that are in your sample. And what's different is that you're now looking only at specific genomes or specific areas in the genome. So your sequencing reads are now dedicated to these areas, which enables higher sensitivity as compared to um, WGS. Mm -hmm. And this is mostly critical also for, as mentioned earlier with wastewater, you usually have lower concentration of your pathogen of interest, so you want to make sure that the technique you're using is sensitive enough to detect your yeah, pathogen you're looking for. Um, and other aspects with targeted sequencing is that it is um, amenable for multi higher multiplexing, so you know, multiple samples you run in a single sequencing run, and of course this helps to reduce the cost. So for this one, we have our Chi-Seq X high viral bacterial panels. Um, these, we have various panels to look at different pathogens and a lot of pathogens that are of interest for wastewater surveillance. And you can look at both the um, pathogens and different variants in addition against the AMR um, mm -hmm. genes. So um, if people are interested to hear more about these NGS technologies. We actually have our Curious Festival coming up, um, all things genomics. So if you um, should stay tuned and get some more information coming up in the next Curious show. Okay, well it sounds very much like the, the technologies are complementary, mm. right? They, yeah, they have okay. a bit of a different application yeah. focus. Um, so if you had to sum up in just yeah. a quick, yeah, yeah. quick view, where would you see the primary application yeah. for these different technologies? So it, it, it's very, very difficult to sum up, yeah? We have we were mm -hmm. been arguing for like 20 hours, but we, we, we found the common ground, I think. Um, and it's really, really in one sentence. So uh, in a toolbox that the scientist can have, so the best tools that he have for discovery, it will be the NGS. And the best tool for routine monitoring, it will be the digital PCR. Yeah, yeah no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thanks, Eli and Afif, for joining Thank us you. on The Curious Thank Show. You. Thank and you. And we'll head back over to Julie. So thank you, Eli, Afif, and Dominic. So as you've seen, it's pretty straightforward. If you want to do discovery, you're going to use NGS. And for routine testing, it's going to be DPCR. But before we move on to human microbiome parts, did you actually know that we could automate the sample extraction? Our colleagues went to the lab, take on some missions to help you choose the best method for you.
A lot of people have been asking which extraction automation is the right fit for the lab. Hmm, I have an idea. Let's each play an instrument and show what role each instrument plays in their lab. Yeah, in this case, I would suggest I be the Kaio Symphony. Oh, cool. I will be the Kaio Cube HD. So, it's the Kaio Cube Collect for me. Excellent. Now that we know who is who, let's start with our first mission. Every other day, 50 to 60 stool samples for microbial DNA extraction for downstream NGS metagenomic analysis, plus daily blood samples for another research study. It sounds like this is the job for me, for Kaya Symphony. See you! The Kaya Symphony SP divides its full capacity into four distinct sample batches. We load the samples in the sample drawer. You can see three of the sample drawers are just occupied by the microbiome samples. And the fourth one is blood samples, which I add now to the instrument. The barcode camera is moving out to detect the barcode. And while loading, the barcodes are detected. It's important to recognize you can load the instrument with different sample prep cartridges, which allow processing of different sample materials in a single run. After loading everything to the system, the instrument is now ready to go. We press the button and let the system work. Mission two, extract microbial DNA from 12 soy samples. Then, extract microbial RNA from eight water samples. Then, extract both microbial DNA and RNA from nine stool samples. All kinds of samples. Looks like I'm up. The Kaya Cube Connect. See you. All right, so I will start with the extraction of the microbial D uh, RNA from my eight water samples. And the software of the Kaya Cube Connect tells you exactly where to place everything. So where to place the buffer, the amount of buffer and the position of the buffer, the tips you have to use, uh, the size of the tips and the amount of the tips. Additionally, the spin columns, so where to place the thick spin columns, which spin columns you need, and also the illusion tube and the position in the rotor. Additionally, we need our eight water samples, so one sample is left, and the software also tells you where to place the sample. And in the end, you can just close the hood and start the protocol. And now we just need to continue with soil samples and also with the stool samples. Mission three, extract microbial DNA from 96 urgent soil samples as quickly as possible. 96 samples, just enough samples for me. See you soon. See you, bye. See you. Hi, meet the Kaya Cube HD. I've already loaded the buffers and the tips. Now I'm just gonna place the 96 swell plate with samples right here. And then it's all ready. We'll close the lid and then we can press on start. I'm all done here. Let's go back. Wow, I'm really impressed. Thank you. We might have our differences, but we do have the same goal to save time. I'll work. And we standardize the front end of every workflow. Kaya Cube Connect, Kaya Cube HT and Kaya Symphony. Three instruments, each with their own advantages. Like a musical conductor, Kaya Symphony can direct multiple samples in a single run. The HT in Kaya Cube HT stands for high throughput, ensuring samples are processed quickly to save you time. While Kaya Cube Connect is flexible to cover your varying microbiome and microbiology research sample preparation needs. How convenient it is to transform manual work to a robot. I think I could really use this in my daily work. Uh, what would you use all the time you saved for? Mm, probably get a chai latte with my colleagues. 
And uh, actually, did you know that in chai latte, uh, there's a lot of spices that are helping against uh, gut uh, inflammation? So it seems that it's also interfering here with the, with the gut microbiome. And uh, since we get there, uh, it's not only in the gut that we have microbes, right, Dominic? Yes, but not only. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Most people think of the gut microbiome when they talk about the human microbiome, um, but there are multiple other options as well. And I have a quick animation that I can show on that. So um, as we zoom in on our person here, um, we'll see that we, of course, have the gut microbiome. That's where most of the bacteria and most of the bacterial diversity in your body are. Um, they are responsible for a lot of your immune system training. Um, they are responsible for, of course, your nutritional uptake, metabolism. Um, but there's also many other things that the microbes in your gut do, such as modulate your mood through the gut-brain access, um, as well as some other things. But I said, even though most people think of the gut microbiome, there's lots of other bacteria on your body that also perform important functions. Um, one that may be fairly obvious is the oral microbiome, so the, all the bacteria that are on your cheeks and your throat and on your teeth. Um, we're very aware of them whenever we get sick and get a sore throat, of right. course, um, or if we have a cavity caused by bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it's very key because the, there's always bacteria there, and it's always just a question of whether they are harmful or beneficial. Um, but there's other microbiomes as well. Most organs have them. Um, in particular, the reproductive tract is a very important area of research. Um, the vaginal microbiome in particular, where again, the healthy functioning of the microbiome um, is essential for good health. Um, and also the skin microbiome. Um, we have a, a biofilm of bacteria along our skin, um, which is very important for keeping our skin healthy and also protecting against invasion of damaging bacteria. Um, and so we can see that the microbiomes all over our body are performing really important functions. Um, and actually to continue talking about microbiomes and their functions, um, we would like to invite Professor Nicola Sagata um, to join us now. Hi, Nicola. Hello. Welcome to the Hello. show. Welcome to the Curious Show. Thank you, Dominique and Julie. Thank you. So thanks for coming to talk to us about microbiome research. Um, uh, we were talking about human microbiome um, and how there's many different areas where it's important. Um, but I think it's not just the different microbiomes in the body. I think there's also many different areas of research in which the microbiome is important. Um, and that would be the first question I want to ask you. Which, which field do you think is probably the most relevant for microbiome research? That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, um, we do microbiome research mostly with uh, metagenomic approaches in my mm -hmm. lab uh, and in the initiatives that we push forward. And one of the very nice things about metagenomics on the microbiome is that uh, we can really apply on a very diverse set of applications. Uh, they go from medicine, nutrition, uh, food safety, just to mention a few. Um, really, I don't know, I can mention, for example, that we are looking at the plaque microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, connected with our teeth or our dental implants to try to understand what is the health status of our, of our uh, teeth or, or implants again. Um, but I can mention, for example, that we also looked with the same techniques to ancient uh, microbial samples. So, uh, you know, uh, they are called coprolites, which is nothing more than fossilized poop. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there's still, uh, there is still DNA there. We can extract that, we can analyze it, and we can have uh, an idea about wh which are the microbes that were there uh, hundreds uh, or thousands of years ago in our microbiome, and uh, maybe they are changing uh, because mm -hmm. of our mutated lifestyle. Yeah. No, I think especially the Western lifestyle has been shown to, to shift microbiomes quite a lot. Um, do you think researching these ancient microbiomes may give us insights into to how to maybe shift it back? Absolutely. I, I think uh, we have a really a large panel of uh, bacteria and uh, viruses and eukaryotes, actually, that we find uh, in non-westernized population and in ancient microbiomes that are almost non-present anymore in our westernized populations, or they are very, very depleted, present in only few individuals. Now, you know, we change the microbiome with antibiotics, which are extremely important uh, for, for many, many reasons, of course. Uh, but as a side effect, uh, these bacteria that we probably lost uh, are important. We should study them more and maybe even try to reintroduce in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the power of metastromics, really untargeted 
survey of uh, the microbial diversity in many different environments. And you can connect those environments uh, to try to really look at the one health approach at, uh, at, uh, at what we do. Yeah, and I think that's an important point, the one health approach, looking at the, the not just the, the, bio, the individual bacteria themselves, but the whole community of them that's there, um, their interactions with the, the human host as well and with the environment. Um, but of course, that means it's, it's incredibly complicated um, to figure out which effects are the critical ones, which ones are really matter and which ones don't. Um, and so what do you think is, is necessary to bring this kind of research into, into routine use where the interpretation is perhaps a little bit more easier? Well, I think in the last 10 years or so, the field uh, really moved forward a lot. And I think uh, uh, the driving forces here are standardization of the approach to really be able to apply it on multiple different sample types uh, with uh, basically the same thing, the same approach. Uh, prices, uh, sequencing especially, uh, you know, decreased a lot in cost. And this is helping a large case investigation, which is extremely important in the field because the microbiome is so variable uh, that we need large number of samples to, to, to make sense of it. Um, last but not least, uh, as a computational biology, uh, biologist, I think it's extremely important to uh, have computational tools able to analyze uh, metagenomic data efficiently and uh, in a relatively easy way for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. These, are, I, think are, I think, are the three main ingredients that are going to push even forward uh, uh, metagenomics for microbiome research. Right. And so standardization is really probably key, right? As um, maybe not necessarily across groups, but at least within the work that you're doing yourself um, should always be done the same way. Yes. Um, um, I think right. that's something yes. that we see. You know, we yeah. analyze that. Yeah, yeah, no, we analyze no. thousands of samples, and uh, in, Arab, in, in order to be able to compare them, we need to process extract in the same way. So we need robotics from the beginning. Uh, actually, even before, we need the same way we collect the samples in, uh, uh, you know, preserve the, 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 the sample while it's arriving to the, it's arriving to, to the wet lab, and then all the standardization possible with robotics able to really make every sample process the same exact way. So mm -hmm. we don't need to use biases, and the differences that we see are actually those that are characterizing our uh, microbial problem. So I actually have a question about that that's very related to, to what I do, right? I'm, I'm developing new products all the time. I'm trying to improve the technologies. Um, and in some ways that is, runs counter to the standardization approach, right? And I want to give you a new method that extracts more DNA or gets a better bacterial diversity or gets archaea when you didn't get archaea before. Um, how do you build that into the standardized process? Um, is there a good way to, to do that? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, we are also part of uh, European projects try to uh, understand what standardization means. So standardization doesn't mean that you need to do always the same thing for the next 10 years. It means that uh, uh, we need to have uh, movie targets uh, uh, of, of standardization, meaning uh, once we understand what is the best thing we can do with what we have available right now, we need to be able to consistently apply to all our, uh, the samples of uh, our project, or, or at least the project we are working on. But uh, as soon as we introduce, you know, we, we, we learn how to even improve the, the, uh, the process, uh, we can improve the standards. The, the important point is that each project should have uh, the same standard, otherwise uh, data will not be reproducible. Yes. But uh, from the computational viewpoint, uh, we can do meta-analysis, so meaning that if there are two studies done with different standards, we can integrate the data. But this is not possible if the standard is changed uh, during uh, the execution of one single uh, project. So, Strategies is important, standards changes, standards improved, and that is, is really important. We need to be consistent within the same project. Yes, yeah, no, I think that that, that covers it quite well. Um, and then we can do comparison studies between one study to the next to make sure that the, you're getting at least the same information, if not more. Um, and you had earlier mentioned about automation. Um, what role do you think automation plays in the standardization of these processes? It's crucial because, you know, robots are doing the same thing very, very consistently. Um, and uh, 
so, so you know, introducing robotics at each step is extremely important. Of course, uh, uh, you know, maybe not all labs will be able to use robots for small projects. No, if you have only a few samples, maybe maybe. Uh, too expensive, or you are unable to really use the power of, of, of robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also, I think, why it's important to move to our uh, large sample sizes and uh, automatized ways, or you know, also to, to uh, integrate multiple uh, projects in the same standards, uh, so we can um, you know, process multiple samples with robotics from DNA extraction to library operation and even sequencing. Uh, and have consistent results uh, at uh, also lower costs. Okay, right. So it's all ways to, to manage the complexity of these microbiome samples wherever possible. Okay. Yes. So then uh, you, you let uh, you know uh, the biology, the computational biologists here to, to be able to uh, really capture all the uh, diversity in a sample and uh, and and discover at the end. Uh, you know, new biology inside is uh, extremely exciting uh, world. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, is there any last thoughts that you would like to, to give our audience as interested in the microbiome? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, actually, for the invitation. And, uh, what you're doing is, is great, I think. And uh, uh, no, I, I just uh, hope that I uh, gave a bit of uh, enthusiasm to everyone about uh, metagenomic research because it's really multidisciplinary uh, and uh, it gives the possibility really to study very diverse problems with the same framework, uh, which I think is what uh, is most exciting of this field for me at least. Yes, I absolutely agree. And the, the fact that it affects so many different areas of human health um, and environmental uh, impacts and the whole One Health concept um, makes the field incredibly fascinating. I agree. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay, so with that, that brings us to the end of our Curious show. Um, thank you all for, for listening. Um, thank you, Julie, for co-hosting it with me. Um, what was your favorite part of the show? Well, first of all, it was a pleasure co-hosting this with you, Dominic. And um, I think there was no better way to end the show with um, Nicola Segera uh, interview. I think there's still so much to discover. Although the field is very young, we made already a lot of progress, but microbes are there and they have some messages to, to give to us. So I think the point of the show was really to unveil the, the secrets of microbes. And uh, I hope this is a step towards, uh, towards this goal. Yes. And uh, yeah, the best is yet to come. That's what I believe. Yes, I agree. Um, I think that the, We've also revealed that there's many more secrets still to, mm -hmm. to be shown um, and that we're trying to do our best to get those uh, secrets fixed with our methods. Um, and uh, I hope that we've been able to excite our audience as well, um, that you've all been interested now in the microbiome and the research that we are enabling. Um, and we hope that you enjoyed your Curious show. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.